Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Zen Honeycutt. I'm the founding executive director of Moms Across America, and this is our Monday night Moms Connect call. And we are the Thanksgiving week of November, and we hope that everybody is buying organic food for your Thanksgiving uh, feast this week. It is really a great opportunity to bring organic food and bring a little label and put it next to the green beans and write organic green beans. That's an awesome way to start the conversation with your family and friends about what is organic and why is that. And, and I'm just going to say straight up, expect people to scoff at you. Expect them to make fun of you and, all, and just roll with it. Just be like, yeah, I got it. And I'm not eating pesticides that destroy, you know, whatever. Just like joke with it. And, um, you know, just go ahead and, and have fun with it. We, my mother-in-law often does two separate meals, one for the people who don't, uh, aren't concerned about GMOs and pesticides and, and one for us. Of course, we cook everything too, all organic, but um, this year she's coming to join us. So everything's going to be organic and it's going to be really awesome. And we hope that you're having an organic Thanksgiving as well. And I have, I have a requirement that when, when I had do Thanksgiving here, I have a re requirement and I'm just pretty much say, if it's not organic, don't bring it. Yes. Awesome. That's how I do all my movie nights, my organic yep. potlucks. And I say the same thing too. It's an organic potluck. Everything. Yeah, gotta bring it. Yeah. And if you don't want to cook something organic or if that's difficult for you, pick up some organic wine or organic juice, you know, yep. or kombucha. Like it's really, it's not a big deal. You don't have to cook something. So um, really I invite everybody to try something new this holiday season. If that's not a thing you normally do, bring only organic and ask for people to bring only organic. Cause um, especially if it's in your house, it's your house. Like Carol says, right. It's your house. All right. So at moms across America, um, we are national coalition of unstoppable moms and we exist to educate and inspire mothers and others to transform the food industry and environment, creating healthy communities together. And we primarily do this by focusing on GMOs and glyphosate and other pesticides and herbicides that are being found in things such as our water, breast milk, our children. I found it in my son, Roundup, in my son, right? We found it in vaccines and crackers and cereal and baby formula and all kinds of things. So if you're watching us for the first time, you're just finding out about GMOs and glyphosate, please go to our website on momsacrossamerica.org and find out about what GMOs and glyphosate and all these different herbicides and toxins are. And uh, we're going to discuss some news tonight. We're going to start off, though, with in introducing just the other people that are on the call right now. We, we usually have other people that join us uh, later as well, but I'd love for, um, for us to start out. Carol, do you want to introduce yourself, say your name and maybe your background and your city and state? Sure. Sure. Carol Grave, Food Integrity Now, and I'm also on the board of Moms Across America. And I live in Murrieta, California, which is Southern Cal. And you're also a health coach? I'm and also a health coach and a life coach. <laughs> and a life coach. And can you just say a sentence about Food Integrity Now, what that is? Uh, Food Integrity Now is a internet talk radio and blog um, that is all about um, what's happening in our food supply and offers health solutions, you know, from some of the best experts in the world. And I've been doing this for nine years. Wow, longer than I have. That is yeah. awesome. Yes, yeah. she, she's pretty. Carol's pretty much interview, interviewed everybody that knows anything about the food supply and the cause that we're we're working on. So it's really great to know you and and go to go to Food Integrity now if you want to find out more about what's going on in food supply. It's great. Thank okay. you. Yes, and Julie, can you introduce it? Unmute yourself and say a little bit about yourself and your city and state. No, you can't. Um, I'll try to unmute you and then you go there ahead and talk. Hi. I'm Julie Bjornsson from Stewart, Florida, and I work in neurology research for brain based research. And I got involved with glyphosate and GMOs when it is affecting the brain development of children. And so my research is setting up preschool academic readiness assessments. Is the brain even ready to go to school and learn? So I've gotten involved with. Citrus, re restoring citrus grows because we need better orange juice for our children. Thank you for your articles, which are great. And um, I've also got a couple of farms that are wanting to restore their land and stop using the Roundup. 
And then I've got a couple golf courses in the area that are also looking for alternatives as well. So we're really, we're moving forward with people becoming aware that they've got to get rid of this. Awesome. Very good. Thank you so much. And you are also meeting with uh, some Native Americans as well, right? Yes, I, yeah, a couple of weekends ago, I spoke with um, the Miccosukee tribe about what we're doing to, re to remove um, Roundup and glyphosate and talked about alternatives as well. And they did a, the meeting was on restoring our relationship with the water and what, what Roundup and glyphosate has been doing to Lake Okeechobee that's caused the the, the uh, well, they call it algae bloom, but really it's cyanobacteria. It's not an algae, but it's a cyanobacteria. They just kind of have called it algae bloom because it's green. Um, and it's causing the red tide and many, just the total destruction of our beaches and our, and our sea life. So it's, um, it's not easy. It's not, it's very difficult down here because you can't go to the beach without getting sick anymore. Mm. Yeah. Very, very unfortunate. Now, I want to I, I want to get to other people to introduce them too, but I do want to ask before I move on, move on, just in case you have to leave later or anything. Um, some people question the connection between glyphosate and the cyanobacteria and red tide. Are you still questioning it, or are you pretty clear on the science? We are very clear on the science. Okay, why? It, well, what happens is that they put they pour Roundup into. They pour tons of Roundup into the Kissimmee River, which is north of Lake Okeechobee. And what happens is it kills all the bacteria except the cyanobacteria, and that lives totally on the phosphates out of the glyphosate. And that we get that from Frank Dean. We've got some articles on that as well. Um, Am I clear about that or do you need, do you have another question? So, so some people would think, well, killing bacteria is a good thing because they think of bacteria as bad. So, oh, well, there's good and bad bacteria, so you need to know which is beneficial, but the beneficial die, and the not, when that goes, that, that keeps everything in balance, but when you kill the good bacteria, then the, the other ones are allowed to thrive, and this is what's thriving, it's causing, causing the problem, and then when Lake, Lake Okeechobee is really a reservoir, it's not really a lake, because it's only fed from the north, and so when the water gets high, the um, Corps of Engineers has to release the water both east and west so the dam won't break. And they can't release the water south if the phosphate levels are too high. So we've got a, a major challenge that's going on right now and it's not getting any better. You know, we've had a lot of the politics right now and the elections were all about the water, but nobody's done anything. And even when they talk about the reservoirs, that they're going to hold the water in and clean the water. You have to be very careful about that word clean because clean means dumping glyphosate in to clean it of aquatic weeds. And as the aquatic weeds die, it releases nitrogen and phosphates, which also feed the, the cyanobacteria. Yeah, and there's a massive death when you're dumping millions of pounds of glyphosate into the water and onto millions of pounds of, of uh, plant growth you know, water, right. water. Uh, it, the tons are incredible. And, tons, and the, water high, the, water, the water hyacinth is a floating plant. And it's actually an edible plant that could be used for either composting your land. One acre of, of water hyacinth can actually um, compost 30 acres of, of soil, or it can be mechanically harvested and given as food to cattle. But they don't do that. They just want to kill it with with the glyphosate and the Roundup. And that's what's causing the damage, but they won't stop. The Corps of Engineers say they, I've talked to them twice, I've done presentations to them, and they just say, well, we're just doing what we're told to do. Right, okay, so then the next question be, who's telling you to do this? And to that's go right, to and, it's, and, and it's he said, she said. Yeah. It's, um, it's beyond what I've been able to do. I, I find that the, the Corps of Engineer does tons of glyphosate and we can get that from public records. And they do that, they have over 20 boat, boats a day in the lake dumping glyphosate in the water. It's killing all the birds. The Audubon has done lectures on this where it's killing all the habitats for the birds around the edge of the lake as well. Um, then, the, then when they release the water, it goes and we have tons of dead fish on the beaches on both sides. And that has to be all cleaned up, hundreds of tons. Yeah, it, it is a absolutely, absolutely a travesty happening, not only in, in right. Florida, but across the country. There's this, right. this cyanobacteria blooms, there's the loss of, of uh, birds and insects. 
And it's true. Yeah, one other problem too is the B BMAA, which is a cancerous toxin that's created in seafood that's harvested in these algae bloom areas. And basically it's the Gulf and all around Southern Florida and it's not being labeled. So people are actually getting this. There's a scientist from the University of um, Miami that's been doing a lot of lecturing on this, trying to educate people. And it, it's horrendous what's going on. Now, does your governor or, um, yeah, I guess is your governor have the power to, does your governor have the power to simply tell, I mean, the position, not this particular person as if they're interested in doing this, but does the governor's uh, role have the power to simply tell the Army Corps of Engineers to stop spraying this? Can you say it verbally? Not that I know of. We have a new governor from this election, so I'm hoping DeSantis will do much better than Scott did. Scott kind of ruined several of our, many of our environmental laws and protections. And so um, actually, Betty Osceola, who's head of the spokesperson for the water in Lake Okeechobee from the Miccosukee tribe, she's gonna be doing a prayer walk around all of Lake Okeechobee in January, 110 mile walk. So we're hoping to draw some attention to this and maybe we can get the, the new governor to actually do something. I'm hoping to join her with that. It'll be about a week long walk. Okay, wow, well that's great. Will you please let us know when that's happening and we'll see if we can get some press for you. Great, thank you. All right, awesome. I and wish I could give you happier news. Yeah, yeah, well, um, you're still on it. I mean, you're still, you know, you're still there and right. you're still raising awareness. And so I would just ask that you um, be, be unstoppable about going to the people who are telling the Army Corps of Engineers yep. and bring them the Monsanto lawsuit information that's on our website under Toxin Free Town, the press release from the Monsanto right. lawsuit. That would be great. I, will, I am writing whoever I can right now, but people have to know what they can do to neutralize. I was just reading Acres USA, a, a blog from them, and they're talking about the residue that's still in the land, even though the industrial farming has stopped. And it can be in the land up to 10 years and it can be at reactivated and kill crops and do all sorts of damage. So you need to know how to neutralize that. And we've got to get that Maybe, maybe we can help you write an article on that. Oh yeah, that would be great. You and, and Frank, I, yep. I talked to him recently. Yeah, we, yeah, please, let's, let's do a guest blog on that, okay? And we can get that out and share it with others. It's really important. People, have, they're doing, they wanna get rid of it and they're doing these home gardens and they're just creating more and more problems for their family because they don't know how to neutralize it. Okay, well, let's do a blog on that. That would be great. Thank you very much, Julie. Okay, Linda, can you tell us um, your, just a little bit more about yourself and your city and state? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Linda Klassen and I'm uh, living here in Sarasota, Florida. Um, I'm working with the League of Women Voters. We're going to be doing some kind of a, an education issue with, uh, about glyphosate and, glyphosate and I am here to learn as much as I possibly can and hopefully I can touch base with Julie because it sounds like um, she right. would be I have tons of articles. I have oh. tons of articles for you. Ah, I'll be yeah. glad to come here. Okay, I've been, I've been trying to find, figure out how I could get in touch with you to, to find out, you know, kind of find out what you, you have know. A I'll give you my phone number. Yeah. Well, don't do not do it on air right now because we're going to oh, air this publicly. Okay. So just in the chat box on the side, if you could put your email or phone number on the chat box, you yeah. see the little bubble down below that says chat, yeah. Linda sure. and Julie, you can contact each other through there. That would be awesome. And Perfect. Thank you. Just, just know for people to know going forward, when you meet with people on this call and you want to connect with them, a really great way to do that is not just through Facebook and social media, because you know people have similar names. You might not be able to find this per the same person, but on our website, you can go to the events page and you can post to really one of your events that is coming up. Like for instance, if you're going to meet with um, the Army Corps of Engineers or with the Native Americans, the Indigenous tribes, post it as an event, and then people in Florida will know. Oh, there's a local person that's taking action. I can join forces with her. Right? I can meet up with her. But there's no real way to connect with each other unless you start, say, your own Facebook page, you know, that's uh, Sarasota, you know, Moms Across America, Sarasota, Florida, right, or something like that, which you can do um, and, and then share it from there. But you, you've got to have a way to connect with each other beyond just, you know, 
sharing in the chat box here because other we're going to post this live, right? I mean, we're going to post this on Facebook and social media. And we want other people from Florida to be able to connect with you. So please do post your events on our website on momsacrossamerica.org under events. Whenever you have any kind of meeting that's coming up, you just post your, um, you can, if you don't want to have your last name on there, you can just post your first name, but you have to have either an email or a phone number for people to contact you. And that way you can connect with local people. Okay. Great. Good. All right. Awesome. And, and um, also if you don't have an event coming up like in the next couple of weeks or something, and you just want to be on the map, you can post, for instance, say a coffee gathering six months from now at a coffee shop, just so that you're on the map and you can write at the top of the introduction. Like if you want to get together earlier, you know, like this meeting is really just a placeholder because I want to connect with people in Sarasota, Florida. If you want to get together earlier, please email me and let's get together next week or something like that. Right. You can just have like a placeholder event there so that people can contact you. Great. Okay. Thanks. Great. And um, also know everybody that we, there are Facebook pages for each state. We don't have them for like each county or city because we need people to take charge of that. So there is a Florida Moms Across America Facebook page and we would love for you, Julie and Linda, to be admins of that and to add people and share and connect with people. Okay. Yeah, so, I'd be happy to do that. Great. So just go to Florida Moms Across America on Facebook and request to be added. And I think we're going to change the um, permission so that people can just join. Um, but just keep in mind, if you have it open like that, when people start to get weird, if there's anybody yeah. that you're going to have to, you know, delete and ban if they, if they get insulting. And our, our policy on that is if there's name calling and insulting, they go. You know, like we're, we're, we're moms, we can all be nice, we're all adults, there's no reason for name calling, right? We, but right. we're okay with people disagreeing, it's just when it gets nasty, you know, we don't entertain that. Okay. So, um, yeah, please do connect locally with your people. That'd be okay. great. Awesome. Thank you, Linda. And um, anything else that you wanted to, you wanted to say? Uh, no, I think that's it. We're, we're in the beginning phases of collecting information, so... Uh, we're just, you know, absorbing as much as we possibly can. We have a small committee, but okay. um, hopefully we can get the word out and get some more awareness down here. Okay, great. And if we have time, once I get through the news, I might do a short, like, talking bit thing about glyphosate for you um, and for other people, too, just so that, that you, you might hear it from a, sort of a layperson rather than reading through scientific studies, right, a yeah. way to communicate it. Okay, so we'll try to get back to that. Okay, good. Awesome. Okay. And Anne. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Temple. I live north of Milwaukee, and um, I do graphics design and some other things for Moms Across America. And um, <clears throat> I have lots of things in the pipeline right now, but I really don't have anything going on, per se. Mm -hmm. um, actually, though, I am helping a friend um, format her book and her the uh, paragraph I was working on last night have to, had to do with glyphosate. So Yay. I've been kind of giving her some uh, information on that. Great. So, and she's, act and she's actually putting it into the book. So, awesome. so that's good. That's so great. Good news. Yeah. Anne is responsible. She's responsible for that book cover right there. She is our graphic design guru. She has done thousands of images for Moms Across America. She really is uh, like, she doesn't know it, but she's the face of Moms Across America because she puts out all these graphic images that uh, really help us explain who we are. Yeah. So um, you're the face of Moms well, Across you know, America. but the graphics are just as much as you know as I am. So the graphics really represent Moms Across America. So that's what I mean. So thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. All right, and Frankie, I, in my past experience, Frankie can't talk to us. All right, Frankie from Detroit. Is that right? Okay, I unmuted you, but you haven't been able to. Okay, so you're here, but for some reason she can't communicate through us. One of these days, Frankie, you need to get some tech help from a 14 year old, okay? So that we can see you and hear you, okay? <laughs> All right, so um, let's start off with some good news, shall we? There is bad news, but let's, let's start out with some good news. Okay, so right off the bat, I want to share that South Africa government rejects Monsanto's GMO triple stacked maize. Yay! Um, and this is great news um, because, well, not only is it GMO and come with, you know, all kinds of risks that we just, you know, don't know of, uh, triple stacked usually means 
that it has the pesticide built in. So it's been genetically engineered to have Bt toxin or pesticide built right into the corn. And that toxin has been known to um, perforate holes or rather explode the stomach of the bug that eats it, right? So it dies. So if it's doing that to bugs, what does it do to human beings? You know, clearly it must be connected to leaky gut that's going on in human beings, right? Holes in our stomachs and uh, food leaking out, causing all kinds of allergies. If you don't know somebody with multiple allergies, you probably aren't very social because pretty much everybody that you speak to these days either is or has a loved one that has multiple food allergies. And it was not like that when we were kids. So BT toxin corn, uh, not a good idea. The other stack means usually that um, it's engineered to withstand a uh, herbicide so that they can spray the entire crop with that herbicide. And usually now it's glyphosate or dicamba or a combination right, of, of different herbicides and uh, 2,4-D, you know, all kinds of cancer-causing chemicals. And so that they can spray the whole crop and the plant will live, but the, the, all the weeds die. And then the other type of stack in this case was uh, drought resistance. They engineer it to have a desired trait. Now, the interesting thing about um, in this article is that is 25,000 people signed a petition to, to fight it. Um, why? Mostly because they were saying that there were wild, unscientific, and um, um, unsubstantiated claims that were made by scientists associated with the project that the BT maize varieties under the project um, is a solution to combat the fall armyworm. Meaning, meaning that um, the, they, the, what they were saying was not actually what was happening, right? That there was really no major difference. There was no significant difference between the drought resistant corn and um, the original variety. So let's see, it further found that yield benefit right, was, uh, were inconsistent. And in some trials, the GM maize had lower yields than that of the conventional maize, which, which makes sense because if you're going to mess with m mother nature, it's not going to function as well as, you know, it's going to get tough. It's going to be resistant. It's going to have kind of like scarring and, and um, you know, things going on inside of the, the, the species. It's just, it just makes sense that it, if you're going to mess with it like that, that it might not perform as well, right? And um, they found that the drought data provided by Monsanto, specifically the kernel count per row and the kernel count per ear data, showed no statistical significant difference between the GM event and the uh, conventional maize. So, you know, you can't, you really just can't claim that this is a, a solution for people and put them at risk with BT toxin and extra herbicides and say that, that, that that's worth it, right? To us, if there is any risk of exposure to toxins and pesticides, it is not worth the, the benefit of, of having more corn. Because if more corn equals more sick people, it's not beneficial to us. You know, life is life, life is sacred. We don't want sick people. Now, maybe the pharmaceutical companies do, maybe they want more sick people. Maybe because they happen to be the sister companies of these GMO, um, companies, perhaps they want more sick people. And uh, that's a very evil, you know, um, convenient and, and uh, profitable uh, circle, you know, profit circle for them. And we would hope that's not what they are doing. Uh, but that is, in, in fact, the case. If the, the, the GMO companies such as Bayer and Monsanto and Dow and DuPont and Syngenta and all of that, they all have sister companies, which are pharmaceutical companies, which stand to benefit from people being sick. So please keep that in mind when, when you have a friend or family member that talks to you about the benefits of GMOs, you can ask them. I, I, I know how you, this is feel felt found from my book, by the way, I hope you guys have my book. Um, well, the cover's right behind me. Um, so yeah, I know how you feel when I found out about GMOs. Um, I, I, thought, I thought the same thing. I thought that they would probably be really beneficial. Like, you know, we all, we could use more food, right? Um, but you know what I found out? I found out that, um, oh, now I just lost my train of thought because thought, there's so many. What was I talking about just before this? Was it the, the um, being triple stacked? No, it was, 
it was something else. You were talking about um, people thinking the benefits of GMO food or. Yeah, there was a bit, but there was a, oh, did you, you know what I found out? I found out that Syngenta's sister company is AstraZeneca, right? Syngenta is one of the largest producers of GMOs and pesticides and herbicides. In fact, they're the largest producer of pesticides. And their sister company is AstraZeneca, which produces 400 drugs that treat the very symptoms that these pesticides can cause. And when I found that out, I, you know, had a, I, I really thought, you know, I got to think again about subjecting my family to these GMOs because I don't want them to be on drugs for the rest of their life, right? And okay, so that's some good news. South Africa government rejects Monsanto's GMO triple stacked maize. And also the Mayan communities and organizations denounce illegal sale of planting GMO soy in Mexico. So this is great that communities and organizations are speaking up um, and they're saying that is, this is absolutely you know, unacceptable. We don't want this grown here. They're transgenic, you know, GMO soybeans. They've been illegally grown here and they're speaking up about it. So um, let's see, in 2017, more than 23,000 hectares of this soybean variety were planted in this certain area, roughly 85% of the crop cultivated that year. So that's not good news, but it is good news that people are speaking up about it um, because we know that these GMOs spread and they can contaminate other crops and they bring with them many, many toxic chemicals. So good news that they're saying no. And also Zambian uh, citizens call on leaders to raise concerns on GMOs at a meeting in Egypt. And this is fantastic. There's a lot of grains grown there and uh, very important to, um, to see. I mean, very just awesome to see that the um, Egyptians and people in Zambia are raising awareness about this. So um, really good news around the world. Now, locally, oh, actually this was a French study. I know that we talked about this last week, but I just do wanna pay, point it out again. It was the number one, one of the number one articles on EcoWatch this week. So if you have friends or family members that are like, oh, I don't really wanna bring organic bread to Thanksgiving, it's so much more expensive. You know, you can just email them this article. Look, organic is for all must become the norm. And it talks about that um, you can cut your cancer risk by eating an organic diet. This is a great article. The findings are dramatic. In a study that followed nearly 70,000 people, those who ate the most organic food lowered their overall risk of developing cancer by 25%. Hello, folks, this is, you know, if you've got family members or friends with cancer in your, um, in your community, th this is the article to show them. This is, this is really fantastic. The relationship was stronger for two types of cancer. Participants who frequently ate organic had 76% fewer lymphomas and 34% fewer breast cancers that developed after menopause. So this is uh, truly a fantastic study. This was the, um, uh, this, this is, uh, I believe, a, a French study. And this research confirms what is intuitive and supports what the Presidential Cancer Panel told us nearly a decade ago, reducing exposure to cancer, um, to cancer-causing chemicals, including pesticides, which includes the herbicides like glyphosate, right, reduces your risk of cancer. So um, the article goes into all the different kinds of health problems. It goes into glyphosate, brain damage in children, you know, chlorpyrifos and organo, or, organophos, organophosphate pesticides like chlorpyrifos, um, and this is why the American Academy of Pediatrics says that children's exposures to pesticides should be limited as much as possible. And all this in green, are, they're hyperlinked to the article. So this is a fantastic article and um, really this should just be shared widely everywhere. So I hope you'll hey, share. Hey, Zen? Yes. Yes. Um, Another, the, the, the cancer thing, um, I, I usually say when people say, oh, you know, that the cancer runs in my family, I usually say, no, it's probably the dinner table that runs in your family. Oh, so, I love that. That's a good one. I love that, Anne. You're so clever. That is great. It's the, din yeah, the recipes and the dinner table that run in the family. That is awesome. Well, and you know, there's another study that shows that, was it, can't, Carol, maybe you know, is it 
of cancers and illnesses are environmental, meaning food and what's in the environment? Is yeah, that- what, what they're finding out now is that the, you know, people used to say, oh, it's, it's just so, it's in my genetics and stuff, but the percentage of the genetics they're finding out is like 5 to 7%. Okay. So um, it's a little bit higher, I think, with breast cancer, but in all the other cancers, it's it's a pretty low it's a pr- pretty low rate. So it is, you know, we we've got to look at this. It could be even more than ninety percent. Then could be ninety five yeah. to ninety ninety seven seven yeah. yeah. percent of the cancers and chronic illnesses are yes. are environmentally related. Yeah, my my son. Uh, my son is researching to become a naturopathic doctor and he's a vegan and he's drawn up this graphic image for me. I've got to find it um, for the next call. And he, he shows that it's, it's like something like 90% or 80% of all the different reasons for death. Um, he connects to being food related, like all the different, you know, like diabetes, right. And, and um, obesity and, you know, all these, all those, all these different, uh, reasons for, um, uh, sorry, all the different ways that somebody could die, a large percentage of them are connected to diet. And so that's Well, that point. makes sense because of um, this figure varies a little bit, but 70 to 80 percent of your immune system is in your gut. So that, that makes sense. It does. Yeah. So if you're putting chemicals in your gut that destroy the beneficial gut bacteria like Julie was talking about when glyphosate goes into the water it destroys the beneficial bacteria so it offsets the bacteria and the the pathogenic gut bacteria I mean pathogenic bacteria in this case the cyanobacteria are allowed to proliferate so what's happening is you're just causing an imbalance of bacteria can cause major health problems and major environmental problems so what we want to do is get that balance back into the gut. And that's why it's great to talk to people like Carol, who is a health coach or health coach in your area, or just, you know, do your research and find out those foods that help get your gut back into um, the gut bacteria back into balance. You know, for so some people can eat fermented foods, which are great. Some people can't um, because they've got, you know, severe gut damage and they have to avoid nightshades and fermented foods and all that. So it's really important to take a look at your diet and keep a log of what you're eating and see how your body is affected. And, and you'll notice some great things too. You'll notice how you feel better when you eat certain foods. You'll, you'll start to be really aware of that. Okay, so the next article, I just wanna point out for people who um, like to do sort of the debate thing, right? right and like to know the good answers to have. Uh, this is a good, very good article um, on GM Watch. It says, are GMO foods safe? Don't ask the New York Times because they recently posted an article by Jane Brody um, that was saying, are GMOs safe? And of course, she comes to the conclusion that, you know, that they're really not as bad as what people are saying. But Claire Robinson wrote this great article to um, refute, you know, uh, what Brody is saying. And her first statement is, we can't say GMO foods are safe any more than we can say snakes are safe. You know, it's a really good point. You know, it's like some snakes are not safe. And you would, you know, you just, you have to know what's going on here, right? And and by the way, all snakes bite. So, you know, what's your definition of safe, right? Or they can bite. So um, she makes a good point here. I want to just point out, I'm not going to go over through the whole article, but Brody here herself, she shot herself in the foot when she admitted This is not to say that everything done in name of genetic engineering has a clean bill of health. Controversy abounds over the use of genetically modified seeds that produce crops like corn, soy, alfalfa, cotton, and sorghum that are resistant to a widely used herbicide glyphosate, the health of effects of which are still unclear. Um, Okay, no, the health effects are not unclear. There are hundreds of studies now, if not thousands, showing that the health effects of glyphosate are clearly serious and can cause death, right, and cancer. So um, big mistake there, that is that is not accurate. So, but um, Claire says, aside from the fact that no glyphosate tolerant sorghum is on the market anywhere, right, that you're pointing out that inaccuracy, Brody is hereby effectively conceding that upwards of 90% of all GMO crops in the U.S. are potentially unsafe. 
And that's because that proportion of the U.S. soy, corn, and cotton crops are genetically engineered to be grown with glyphosate herbicides, which Brody concedes has prompted controversy over its health effects. Notably, the, the World Health Organization's cancer agency, the IARC, which stands for International Agency for Research on Cancer, has classified it as a probable human carcinogen. And by the way, they classified it as a definite animal carcinogen. The last time I checked, we were also animals. We were considered the classification of animals too. Right? <laughs> so, and our, you know, and our animals are eating this food, our pets are eating this food and then, and then livestock are eating these gly glyphosate and then we eat them. So I, that is, no, makes no sense. I think they can only say probably human carcinogen because they don't have studies specifically on humans showing cancer, right? They have them on rats. And so they have to say probably because they don't have scientific evidence to show that it causes uh, cancer on humans in a scientific lab, okay? But we do have it. We do have uh, plenty of evidence. Look at the 8,700 people that have sued Monsanto um, that have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then we have studies showing that there's you know, up to a 50% increase of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when people were exposed to glyphosate. And then we have the other study we just talked about that showed a 70% decrease of lymphomas when people were not exposed to glyphosate. So you do the math folks, really not good odds if you're exposing yourself to glyphosate as far as lymphoma is concerned. So, um, so then she goes on to argue, you know, that this um, imperial, empirical sort of argument, like they say this and then, well, here's my counter argument to that. You know, you can't say all snakes are safe, that kind of thing. Um, there's no proper studies and um, there's potentially lethal allergenicity in GM food. I am a person who has seen my son almost die in front of my eyes from a food allergy. And this is no laughing matter. This is not, this is not just like, ah, slap a cream on it and just hope it goes away. You know, allergies are extremely serious and, um, and they sh absolutely, from this standpoint alone, folks, don't you think, Carol, for there being allergenic effects, GMO should be labeled, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> from that point alone, never mind the cancer and endocrine disrupting, you know, um, uh, effects, but uh, we have on a label on all the food, this, this product contains wheat, this product contains soy, it contains eggs, it contains dairy, right? For the allergenic effects. Well, why the heck isn't GMO food labeled then? This product contains GMO foods, which may be allergenic. What the heck? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that is something that's not being talked about a lot. It's not. The health aspects are not being talked about, especially when we went through the GMO labeling, because they didn't want to argue. They didn't want to have like, oh, well, we don't have enough studies. And we have this study that says it's safe, but this study that said it, it doesn't. But I think it's time to revisit it just from that standpoint alone, because we do have studies showing allergenicity now. And we also have, thanks to the lawyers, the backup knowledge that Monsanto knew these products could cause harm and hid that information, right? They knew it. And so um, we, we, there's, there's a you know, undercurrent of, of dishonesty that if you bring that to a courtroom now or to policymakers, you would think that they would have to acknowledge that and say, okay, yeah, maybe there's some more uh, problems going on here than we originally thought. So um, very good article. Hats off to Claire Robinson, who always does an amazing job with her articles. Okay, and um, not good news is that the GM American chestnut tree um, is being called a Trojan horse to open the door up to commercialize GM trees. So, yeah, so now they're trying to say, you know, we need to genetically modify some of these trees. Uh, usually it's order, it's a, it's in order to save a species, right? That's being overcome by a certain pest or, um, you know, certain type of plague or whatever. I don't have all the details on this one because um, I just got this article, um, but they're saying it's about forest health, right? We, we need to have more healthy trees, just like they're trying to say with, you know, like they did with um, golden rice. We need to have more healthy rice, right? Which turned out to not be true at all, that it did not have a sufficient amount of vitamin A. Um, so they want to use the majestic American chestnut tree, tree to support commercial development of GE trees like poplar, pine, and eucalyptus that have been strongly opposed by huge numbers of people. 
The last time the USDA accepted public comments on GE trees, they received comments opposing them signed by more than 284,000 people. That's just awesome. Really great. So keep in mind that petitions can make a difference, right? It may not in the end change that policymaker's mind, but it can be used in articles and in, you know, advocates that are talking about this to say, look, this is how many people stood up and said, we don't want this. Okay. So please don't ignore the important petitions that are put out there. Um, it, it does, it, those numbers, you know, do make a difference. Right. And if this was a million, it would have made even a bigger difference. Right. So, um, okay. So keep your eye out on GM trees. If you talk to your, your, representatives and your senators and all that you make meetings with them you've got newly elected officials most in most places around the country it's a really good time to ask for appointments and you talk to them about um, how you do not want gmos right in your area um, okay this is a little bit older i think this came out a couple weeks ago but i do want to point out that um, testing on hair is being done now for herbicides right and this was done in the uk germany belgium all of this France and, um, and that there was, there were pesticides found 60% analyzed samples contained at least one pesticide re residue and 23% of analyzed sam samples contained at least two pesticide residues and um, 15 pesticides out of 30 were detected at least once. So th there's a high prevalence of pesticides in the people um, in Germany, Denmark, UK, Italy, France, and Belgium between the end of January and October 2018. Now, this is Europe where they, they do have higher restrictions of pesticide use in the, than the US and much better restrictions than people in like Hawaii, for instance. News came out in Hawaii a couple years ago that some children were tested and these children had up to 35 different pesticides in their bodies. Mm. Yeah, and keep in mind that no one is doing testing on what the synergistic effect is, right, of having that many pesticides and, and different types of pesticides in their bodies. Coincidentally, in Hawaii, they also have, and I don't think not so coincidentally, but they also have 10 times the amount of birth defects in their babies, um, specifically one which is called, um, um, oh, it's gastrocesis, gastrocesis. It's when the intestines are outside of the body when the baby is born. And um, that's a very prevalent birth defect in, in Hawaii. And it's starting to happen more and more in the US as well. And I think it's also related to exposure to atrazine and 2,4-D, which has been used on, on crops in the US uh, just recently, you know, in the past year and dicamba as well. So we're gonna be seeing um, more things like that. Okay, and then this one is talking exactly about that, atrazine. Hormone disrupting weed killer taints tap water for millions in the corn belt. Now, this is an article talking about the seasonal spikes of atrazine. There's certain times when they spray it, and it's a weed killer that can disrupt hormone and harm developing fetuses, contaminate the drinking water in the corn growing areas of the Midwest and beyond, according to analysis of federal records by the Environmental Working Group. So these were federal records that the, the, you know, the U.S. The US um, protect EPA data that they're showing um, is that atrazine levels can spike three to seven times above the legal limit in late spring and early summer. But by avoiding water testing during peak periods, some water utilities stay in compliance with drinking water regulations. Isn't that sneaky? So they don't test the water during late spring and early summer, just so that they don't look like they're out of compliance and they don't have to tell the customers that they were exposed to hazardous chemicals in their tap water. That's just outrageous. Yeah, I, I'd like to interject a little bit on atrazine too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Several years ago, maybe like four years ago, I interviewed Tyrone Hayes, who was a scientist, or still is at, um, in Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And he was hired by Syngenta to test atrazine. And what he found was just astonishing. It, it, he found that it had such hormone disrupting properties that it actually turned male frogs into female frogs. Yes. And 
And, and Syngenta did not like that news, so they tried to discredit him. They, they, um, they actually threatened him, but they were exposed during this process. So atrazine is, is really a nasty, nasty one. And it's banned in many other countries. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and so there's actually three ways. I saw him speak at the Beyond Pesticides conference recently here in Irvine. And there were actually three ways that I got clear on that atrazine affects. Number one, it can turn the male frogs into females by, um, that, well, they actually become hermaphrodites. They grow ovaries. So they both, they have both reproductive organs. Yeah. And then number two, they could make them um, simply become asexual. They, they just don't, they're not interested in mating at all. So the species can die out, right, very quickly. And number three, it can uh, have male frogs mate with male frogs. It can turn them homosexual. So in all of those cases, you're pretty much wiping out the frog population, right? Because they're not reproducing normally. And, um, you know, when you think about what's going on in the world, you know, these lowered sperm rates, um, entire communities in Japan and Korea where the, the people in their 30s have never had sex, they're not interested in having sex, they don't want to get married, they're not having children, they're not reproducing the way they normally should. You've got to wonder if the agro high levels of agrochemicals in those areas and in their food, you know, might be contributing to that, right? These endocrine disrupting chemicals that we're exposing our populations to. And then, and then also the, um, you know, a seemingly increased amount of transgender issues going on with children. And what concerns me most about that is not that they're transgender. I know some amazing, they're just, you know, anyway, it's not that issue. The issue is that 50% of children that are tran transgender, and I believe gay too, you know, that, that uh, have uh, sexual identity issues attempt suicide. And that's yeah. simply not okay. Simply yeah. not okay that these children are, would think that there's something wrong with them so much so that they would attempt their, to kill themselves. And the other tragedy is that many, um, many communities uh, shun those children, right? They kick them out, whether it's a religious community or a, just a family community or, you know, a, a town or a city, they, they shun those children. And, and I think that is, that is, that is cruel and uh, should not be happening. So I would really ask people to consider what is the chemical impact, you know, to our, our hormones. And if, if you do know a young person or an older person that's going through you know, changes like that to be compassionate about why that might be happening. Yeah, and a hormonal imbalance in this country is at an epidemic. So it really does beg the question, you know, what has changed? Yes, so. and, and it's um, the hormones, most, you know, most people don't think about it. They just think about moodiness and women when you think of hormones, right? But the hormones are what do things like, um, you know, help with mental, suppress, you know, mental illness, depression. Um, in, in the gut bacteria is where the hormone serotonin is. Without serotonin, the body can't regulate insulin. So what happens if you can't regulate insulin? Diabetes, right? Yeah, so, and, your, and your thyroid issues. I mean, the list goes on and on. Thyroid issues, weight issues, mm -hmm. mental illness issues, um, eczema, psoriasis, lupus, Mm -hmm. ALS, all of these different autoimmune issues, right, can all be linked back to the hormones, the lack of hormones and the imbalance of gut, the gut biome, you know, the bacteria in the gut biome can all be linked back to that. So if you know- Can I add something? Yes, please. Okay. Um, the, there are amino acids, essential amino acids that are precursors to those like serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, and that those are what are being bound by glyphosate in the soil so it doesn't get in the plant. So we're actually missing those essential, eight, at least eight essential amino acids. And a lot of times people don't realize that we can add that, if we can get somebody to test us or just add the extra amino acids, these essential amino acids, we can at least bypass some of the problems. Oh, isn't that wonderful? So you can take a supplement of amino acids to support that? Right, because those, those eight amino acids our body cannot make. And yeah. those are precursors to serotonin and what you're talking about. Oh, wow. So definitely seek um, support through a holistic or functional medicine doctor yeah. or naturopath. Or just, just take, just learn about the amino acids and take them. You know, okay. um, you've got to take double 
So find a good source with a vegetable. Because if you get a vegetable capsule, you're okay. But if you get the regular capsule, it's made out of the gelatin from GMO fed animals. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm just like, there's just too many things to know. Yeah. Look into it more. No, but this is why these calls are valuable. Cause I always learn something new and you know, we appreciate your input. So the importance of amino acids in our diet is something I have not really been right. thinking about. A lot. The so, word is essential. The essential amino acids, the ones that our body does not create. Okay. And the other one, the biggest problem is the counterfeit glycine that, that glyphosate incorporates into our protein production that actually causes our proteins to malfunction and malform. I, I thought it was just the three aromatic amino acids mm. that because that re, that's required with the bacteria in our gut to, uh, to make those. And because of the gut, gut bacteria is upset with like glyphosate and some of these others, that, that, that it was just those three aromatic amino acids. Am I wrong? Where, where did you get your information? Um, MIT. Dr. Stephanie Seneff? Yeah, she'll talk about the essential amino acids. Yeah. Right, but, but when I, and I've, I've listened to her and I've looked at her stuff and she talks about just those three aromatic amino acids. But then also the misfolding of the proteins with the glyphene, when the, 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 the glyphosate substitutes for the glycine, but my understanding was just those three aromatic amino acids. I wish it was that simple. Okay, I'll, I'll look more into it. Right, but, just uh, look at the precursors for serotonin, melatonin, and, and dopamine. Those are the three major problems we have right now. Right, okay. Yeah, um, Stephanie Seneff is always updating her information. I mean, she's just researching on this all the time. So there might be new information that she's put out recently. And um, I, I've got extra information too. It's just that I'm not going to pull it up right now because I don't have it in front okay. of me. Okay. No, no, I understand. I, I just appreciate that information. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to clarify. Thank you so and, much. And there, you're, you're there. looking at tryptophan phenylalanine and tyrosine, I believe those are the three major ones that I'm talking about right now. Yeah, those mm -hmm. are the three amino, uh, aromatic amino acids, yes. Yeah, because right. there's nine, nine essential, right? Right, well, there are nine, nine essential, but okay, yeah, I mean, the, the, the studies that I've seen with Dr. Seneff just indicated there's three aromatic ones, but they are pro precursors of neurotransmitters. Okay, so we're talking about the same thing, but it's yeah. nice to have the name so you can at least look at the bottles and know how much you're getting. Yep. And make sure you are getting those because it's, it's sad that it's bound up in the soil, so we don't get it. And then our big problem is creating cell membranes that actually keep our cells healthy so we can make energy and it's not happening. It's, it's disrupting the calcium the calcium channels, how they developed, and then, and never mind. <laughs> I won't talk anymore. Go okay. ahead, Sid. I'm well, sorry. thank you. We, we just, we, it's all very important information, but we do want you to know that um, you do need to know about atrazine as well, right? It's in, it's in the water supply. Having good filters uh, is very important. Heavily sprayed on golf courses. Heavily. Oh, yeah. Golf courses as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and when you're, and when you're changing the hormones, you know, of, of people, things in men happen, like they grow breasts, right. Or they get extra a weight around their, uh, their stomach, you know, they, yeah, they get extra chubby because their hormones are changing. So you want to, you know, just realize that, that, that those are, those are like symptoms of hormones changing in their body. They'll have less testosterone. They'll have less drive, less focus, less energy, um, and, and I don't, I don't know why I'm just talking about men because plenty of women golf too, but you know, that, that's uh, just something to be aware of if you have a golfer in your life. Well, most of the endocrine disruptors are estrogenic. Um, so they affect the men more. Right. Yeah. And, and can cause breast cancer as well, but um, yeah, can affect mm -hmm. the men more. So uh, very good article again, um, EWG about atrazine. I do not for the record, again, agree with their assessment that 160 parts per billion of glyphosate is safe to consume in food. Yeah. I do have to mention that if we ever send the e people to the EWG, we need to mention that we do not agree with that aspect of what they put out and also that they have sweet corn on the clean 15 list 
Um, there are many varieties of GMO sweet corn. And so to put that on a list without specifying that it has to be non-GMO or organic, you know, sweet corn is, oh, it's high. is well, really- what was, what was the rational basis for the 160 parts per billion? They said that they used the numbers that the EPA had and then oh. re reduced the amount by a thousand because that's what you need to do for children, that the EPA had never done that because remember that guy, uh, Jess Rowland, he fought, you know, to have that stipulation. Usually when they do a, um, a study, they come up with a certain number, number that's a safe level for adults, right? And then if children are gonna be exposed to it, they reduce that amount by a thousand. That's just some random but, number they picked up. But those that. are arbitrary, yeah, those are arbitrary numbers and, and yeah, I, I don't believe them. Yeah, so uh, there, you know, the fact is, is that there's plenty of studies now to show that the data that the EPA has considered and considers safe um, could be and has been ghostwritten by Monsanto. So you really, that's number one, okay? It's being ghostwritten yeah. by Monsanto or supported by Monsanto. Number two is, it, it was revealed by, I believe, Samsell that, um, that the lab chow, the animal chow given to the animals in these studies contains glyphosate. So you can't, there's no control group for these yeah. studies. So they, what they do is they base these studies on, is there a statistically significant number of animals that had, you know, tumors or organ changes or reproductive changes, right, in the study. But if both groups are getting glyphosate sprayed, you know, lab chow, then there is not likely to be a statistically significant number, right? You're gonna get tumors in this group and you're gonna get tumors in that group. And that's why the study that was retracted that Sarah Laney did, the GMO proponent said, oh, but those, the animals that he used in his study were prone to cancer, right? Well, they were not prone to cancer. They were all simply eating food that had a chemical on it, which is likely to cause cancer in them, to cause tumors, or sorry, maybe not necessarily cancer, but tumors, right? Which to me equals cancer, but okay. So um, yeah, so they, that, that's the second reason. And the, the, you know, the third reason is uh, that these studies are you know, questionable is that they don't, they tend to not use independent science. They tend to use the science only from the manufacturers. So they disregard independent science. Right, and they disregard it if if it's not replicated exactly the same way, even if it shows that it causes breast cancer or you know all kinds of things. So they just choose, they pick and choose which studies they want to um, base their information on, and uh, th that does not give a a fair and balanced you know assessment. The, the other thing is it, it, uh, Evangelos Valientos, who was an EPA employee at the EPA for, I believe, 29 years, said that he saw them throwing out rats or throwing out butterflies or, or whatever animals that they were studying um, in a study and, and in order to, to not include those dead animals in the results of the study. You know, that's not, that's not science. That's, not, that's fraudulent, you know? So um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to say that the, EP, the science that the EPA is basing their information on is not sufficient and um, people will not want to hear that from a mom who's not a scientist but when you look at the information that's been presented to the public in just the past few years you've got to question how what they're basing their science on you know in, a, in addition i did do a freedom of information act to the epa and ask them for the studies that show because they said when i met with them oh we have hundreds of studies showing the safety of glyphosate right and, um, and like they say that with many different chemicals that they approve. And, and I said, not on humans, you don't. And they said, well, it's not ethical to test pesticides on humans. And I said, well, if it's not ethical to test pesticides on humans, how is it ethical to allow these pesticides in our food, you know, and in our breast milk? You're poisoning our babies. You have to stop it and stop it now, right? And, um, so they, yeah, there was another point to that too. Oh, and then, oh, so I asked them, I did the Freedom of Information Act. I, I got some of those studies. They didn't send me hundreds. They probably sent me 20 or 40. And some of them were only assessed like a summary of the study. It wasn't the whole study. They would just send me a list of like, oh, here's 20 studies. But it was just a summary of them. It wasn't the whole report. So a few of them that I did get, get I would say about 20 
studies in full. One of them was an oyster study, and it showed that the oysters, after four days, and I quote, most of the oysters were closed and not feeding. Now, they weren't dead, so they can't say that they died from toxicity, right? But closed and not feeding, to me, means like coma. And what happened on the fifth day, right? Closed and not feeding is not healthy. That does not show safety. But because they weren't all dead, more than 51% dead, they, base, they say that's a safety study. They say that that study shows safety. That's completely messed up. That's just not, that's just not showing safety. Okay, so Carol has posted um, something about amino acids by Stephanie Seneff. So if you want to go to our chat box and uh, open that up, that's great. Um, she loves Purinize is something that's on her site as well that gets the nasties out of water. Purinize, you might, might want to check that out. I believe that we'll be having an affiliate um, on our website of that as well soon. And um, let's see, filtering out glyphosate still sends it somewhere and it's not destroyed. Purinize will destroy it. Okay, good. Thank you, Julie. Um, also, apple cider vinegar, sauerkraut, and uh, kombucha. Uh, have a bacteria in it, which is called acetobacter. And Stephanie Seneff has found that it will actually um, break apart the molecules of glyphosate and make it be no longer my glyphosate. And so the glyphosate disappears and it degrades it. So that's awesome. That's what we want. We want it degraded. Yes, yeah. we want it degraded. Yes, because if it's not degraded, it just goes through your urine or feces into the water supply and then there's glyphosate still out there in the water supply. Yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so anybody else want to add anything or, or talk about any issues? Um, I just want to say that I watched Secret Ingredients and it was awesome. You did a great job, Zen. I was crying when you were talking about your son and, and the allergies, so it was really moving. Oh, thank you, Carol. It's a great movie. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Please, everybody, watch Secret Ingredients and share it. It's a great movie to share with your family this holiday season. Just say, sit down, pop. I want to show you a movie. This is a, it's a, it's a feel good movie. Where, there, right? where do we get, Secret where do we get it? Secretingredientmovie.com. Mm -hmm. you can, and you can get it. Um, you can, you can rent it. You can buy it. You can get it through iTunes. And if you do watch it, um, I emailed Jeffrey because I was having a little problem with my credit card. Just, like it, it just was doing weird things. And I thought he, he probably needs to know this, you know, mm -hmm. anyway. And he asked that if I could share with um, people, if they, if they like it, please leave a review on there. So oh, if yeah. you watch it and you like yeah. it, review it. And so you were able to work the problem out and purchase it. I was, I was, and uh, I had to end up buying it on iTunes and, and then the customer support the next day contacted me. So the point was there was good follow-up. Good. You know? Okay, great. And it's a fantastic movie. It's Yes, Julie. Okay. Uh, I wanted to change the, the subject for a minute. Okay, um, it was brought to my attention that the corn that they use for the ethanol is GMO. And that could be actually putting it in the air. So anybody living close to highways or where there's a lot of traffic could be affected. Um, Wow, I never thought of that. And so I was wondering if you had any articles or you would just look out for articles. Because I, I haven't found one that I, I can rely on yet, but I, I believe that that's true. Yeah, I think Stephanie's talked about that a lot too. She'd like to have some testing done on, mm -hmm. on that because, yeah, it doesn't destroy the molecule, right? And that's no. yeah, no. not destroyed. So, um, yeah, there would need to be more air testing on that, right? And emissions testing. On, on I can't even get them to test lead at the airport and they're selling leaded gasoline and flying right over our schools here. Yeah, it's, it's really chemical companies got, it's the chemical companies that are really the bane of our existence right now. And that we like, need people in office that are going to put stricter uh, laws around, you know, these com com companies that are emitting these harmful chemicals and selling also, them. Also with the testing, um, I've gone to, several people here and they just say, oh, it's too difficult to test, do phosphate testing, but there's four separate sources for phosphate. So when you do the phosphate test, um, it's not always sewers. It's not always the runoff. It's not always the cattle manure. It's, it's Roundup, but they don't want to do the test to show that it is the Roundup. So um, 
they'll just say it's too expensive and they haven't done it to differentiate exactly where it's coming from so they'll try to give you a smoke screen and say let's fix the sewers or let's do this or that but it's really the roundup yeah well that's why we need to be vocal and active and we're going to be doing a fundraiser next week i hope um you guys will share it if we can get more money for testing we can do more testing you know and things we can push the envelope here and and you know we were the first ones to test for glyphosate and the first ones to find it in breast milk and water and urine and um, vaccines and it has sparked more people to test for glyphosate and many different things. It's also in the womb and in the amniotic yeah. fluid and I'm trying to get those those studies as well. Oh great, so thank you Julie. Yeah that would be great. I, I will say that I uh, I think I mentioned last week on the call that I had my um, arsenic level tested after what Sarah Laney said about the roundup and I really didn't know how to read it, so um, I was pretty bold. I sent my test results to Sarah Laney. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> and, he, and I said, if you don't have time, fine. But he said, it looks good. I was virtually non-detectable. So. <laughs> oh, good. That's yeah. wonderful. Good to know. I was not. When I was very sick, I had Epstein-Barr virus. I later found out that um, I had four parts per billion of arsenic in my body. And uh, the doctor said, that's not good, but it's pretty normal. She said she's been seeing a lot of that at, back at that time. And she also said that the Epstein-Barr virus can like rear its ugly head again when there's toxins in the body. So when you have toxins and stress in your body, the Epstein-Barr virus can come back. I mean, that's when I was stressed out about um, being attacked before the first parades and um, I, I was down to 113 pounds. I was like a toothpick. I was so skinny and um, really, really sick. Yeah, so I, I don't know what my levels are now. I haven't gotten tested again. I, I, I should take a look at- That's a good tested. reminder that stress is a trigger for autoimmune. There needs to be a trigger and that was your trigger. Yes, yep. So, so okay, well, I do wanna ask the question I said in the, uh, was somebody else something to say? Was Anne, did you wanna say uh, something? Yeah. I, I just wanted to say I was rereading this uh, paper, and in fact, the glyphosate does interfere with those three aromatic uh, amino acids. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's what yeah, Stephanie Senek was saying. Yeah, can you lower the screen so we can see your face when you talk? We can just see the top of your head now. <laughs> it's, well, I'm sitting. <laughs> or sit up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, either way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, so um, Linda, before we get to, I, wanna, I want everybody thinking a little bit about, I'm gonna ask you a question about if, when you go to our website, what is there, I mean, what's missing that might make a difference or what's there that you would like tweaked, okay? So I'd like everybody to think about that for a little bit, but while I do that, and you can go to the website if you want to, um, while I'm doing that, I wanna just share with Linda who asked about how to talk about glyphosate in a way, you know, in, in front of people. I wanna share that on our website, we have talking points for the, it's, I think it's called town hall talking points. And they're very good talking points, very short sentences that are clear for people to understand. So I want, I'd like you to, to go there and to use that for your next meeting or one of the things that you use for your next meeting. And you can have different people get up and say different things. Like you can circle the top four and have that be what one person says and the next four for another person and allow them the time to add in something personal. Like for instance, when we went to speak in Mission Viejo, which is now it's going organic by July. So by January 1st, the new contractors come in and they will be advised to not use glyphosate and you know, uh, toxic chemicals. Then by, by July, they have to be, or June maybe, they have to be compliant. So really excited about that. But they stopped spraying in, in our neighborhoods a long time ago when we first complained about it. So it can be done, but we use those talking points. And also a mom got up and just said, listen, you know, she was pregnant. And she said, by the time my baby is born, I would like Mission Viejo to be toxin free. And, you know, just, you know, I'd like a safe place for my baby to grow up, you know, just being um, ad libbing and, you know, just being honest and sharing why you're there and why it's important to you is, is really great. You don't have to have kids. You can just say, I want it to be safe for myself or my niece or my dogs. Right. And just that personal um, touch really makes a difference. And, um, also, one of the main points to say is that uh, that the the Monsanto trial recently uh, held in San Francisco Supreme Court, the jury found Monsanto guilty on all counts, and that included 
them that Monsanto and the executives were guilty of um, malice and oppression, meaning that they knew that their products could cause cancer and they suppressed that information. They hid it from the public. That is a really important point to get across to the city council and officials and that this jury awarded um, this school groundskeeper $289.2 million. Now the judge reduced it to $78 million, but she upheld the verdict, which is a very big deal. And there are now 8,700 other people in line to sue just for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, this is, this is not include uh, endocrine disruption or, um, you know, birth defects or um, all kinds of other health issues that have been related to, to glyphosate herbicides. So um, please do make sure to relay that point of this trial to them because nobody likes lawsuits. And, and you're not saying that you're going to sue, but there could be a groundskeeper in your city that might take it upon themselves to sue and not just sue Monsanto, but sue his employer who required him to use this product after the fact, right? All of these cities that are still requiring their groundskeepers to spray this chemical after the fact that it has been found that, you know, Monsanto knew that it could cause cancer and didn't stop using it. That, that, that to me is complicit with, you know, intent to harm. If they're, if they are not saying this should stop, they are a part, a party of harm happening to their employees <clears throat> and the public. So please do go to the, 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 um, the toxic, the, our website where it says action and then toxin free town campaign and you can see those talking points. Okay. Is that helpful? Great. Okay. And in there goes into all the ways that glyphosate's harmful, you know, the endocrine disruption and the, you know, chelator and cancer and all that stuff. So, um, so Julie is saying the product she uses to restore citrus groves here in Florida is NutraSmart from Lido Chem. So if you want to restore um, the soil and anywhere in landscaping and your garden, all of that, I would look into that. I have not tried it. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying that one of our moms here is, you know. Can you say that name again, Zen? NutraSmart from- Put it in the, it's in the chat. Yeah. Oh, it is? Yeah, okay. Smart from Lidochem, L I D O C. Oh, I got it. I got it. Okay. Right. Um, because you can test all the all the chemicals you want, but it's not going to get rid of them. NutraSmart gets rid of um, many, many, many of them. And also, um, I Purinize is only one name for the the product that's used, and I've also used it in in a large amount to neutralize chemicals in the soil as well, it, right. along with glyphosate. So you can get it in a larger amount from the company. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, so has everybody thought about, or does anybody have any input? Is there anything on our website, any way that Moms Across America can support you that we're not currently doing or a way that you're not sure if we're doing? You know, what what could Moms Across America be doing, on um, have on our website or be doing to support um, all of you and what, what you're up to? Anybody have any input or ideas? You're doing a great job. I'd like to see a, I'd, li I'd like to see a sidebar that lists like the most current blog, so it's right on the front page. Oh, you know how the websites have that because our 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 front page on the web page there's not not a whole lot there, so we I, I would like to have that make it easier for people it's, to to get to the there, blog. It's there. It's actually all the way down on the bottom. Yeah. I like so it. I think it should. Be I think it should be a sidebar. Right. Yes, yeah, I agree with you. It should be in the sidebar, the upper right, yeah. Yeah, it just needs to be organized in a better way, I think. Yeah, yeah. great, and, and and we can do that, and we're, we're planning on doing that uh, before our sixth anniversary, February 13th. So we're gonna revamp just the front page, and we're hoping to redo the whole website, like all kinds of different things within 2019, but I want just the front page at least revamped. Um, in the next couple of months. So anything else? Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Okay. Great organic Thanksgiving. Yes, have a great organic. I just, I just, I forgot, I forgot to tell everybody, but this Saturday um, I was, we, I hosted a um, vegan Thanksgiving with some other people in Milwaukee. And we had probably 80, 80 to 90 people there. 
Everybody had to bring a dish to pass. I'm sure they weren't weren't all organic, but I talked to so many people, and I brought a stack of Moms Across America brochures with me. I literally asked people, I said, you know, can you take these to your library? Can you drop some of these off here? And I went and I kept going through my thing about, you know, the EPA allowing 160 crops to be desiccated, and so many people didn't know about that, so... Yeah, it was good. I had a lot of people come up to me and ask me for my contact information because they wanted to talk to me more. So I'm like, here you go. So that's it was awesome. a lot of fun. That's how first, we do it. <laughs> and for the first time in our household, Anne, we have vegan options for Thanksgiving. We're gonna we got like this loaf thing from Native Foods that that my husband and my son will have instead, and we will all try it too. And um, yes, yeah, so we're making some. <laughs> some I problems. have a recipe. I have a recipe I'll send to you um, for this loaf thing that I made. Mm -hmm. It's a vegan thing and it tasted, it was almost kind of like a meatloaf, but it had this gravy that you put on top of it. It was delicious. Oh my God. And it was even better the next day. That's so great. Okay, so I want to close with some really good news. You guys know Isabel from Connecticut? Yeah. So she's not on the call today, she said, because I wanted to share with you some, but I want to share with you some good news, which is the reason why she hasn't started. She's, she's um, doing some volunteering for us, but she hasn't started it yet because the Connecticut, um, na uh, Connecticut Northeast or Northeastern uh, Organic Farmers Association has asked her to be on the board. Oh, wow. wow. That's Isn't great. That Awesome. And this is just because she took on wanting to get glyphosate out of her town. And so she went and talked and she connected with the, the local um, groups that were training landscapers on how to get glyphosate out of their town and, you know, and toxic chemicals, right? I say glyphosate, but I just mean all of them. And so she's a mom that has just stepped up out of nowhere, become vocal, and now she's on a board, which is part of what one of our goals were for our five-year plan was to have some of our moms get on boards. And I'm currently on the Connecticut, I'm sorry, the California Organic Products Advisory Committee. So that happened right around our five-year goal, which was fantastic. So I'm telling you folks, you say what you want in the world, you can make it happen. But it's yeah. only gonna happen if you say so, and if you envision it, and if you enroll people in helping you with that. So if you have a goal, you want you know glyphosate and toxins out of your state, you share it far and wide. And ask people to help you and put it on the board and say by when you're going to do that. And I, I promise you, when you do what you love, all the world conspires with you. And, and you can do it. Yep. So, um, yes, and Frankie, you say you get angry too fast. You mean, you mean about people that say you can't do it? Or if it doesn't happen like that? Well, um, oh, to be on a board. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Um, take that passion and just channel it into um, finding more facts and finding more studies that 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 um, you know pull up what you what will back up your your studies. And um, I just took I'm just gonna to to drop this out there. I just took an amazing communication course at Landmark. And if you want to have any breakthroughs in communication or in leadership, if you're afraid to get up and stand in front of the room in front of you know 20 people or a thousand people. Um, Look at look up Landmark Worldwide, landmarkworldwide.com. There's a Landmark forum that you take first, and then later on you could take a communication course. And it's absolutely one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life, except for marrying my husband and have my kids. It's, it's totally phenomenal education. So if you want to have a breakthrough and not being angry at people, being able to be with anything that people say to you, and, um, and just acknowledge them and provide the information that they need to, in order to have them see your perspective in another way. That's a, it's a great course to take. Okay, so we're gonna go, we're gonna say good night everybody. And it was really fabulous John here. Linda, please stay in touch with us and connect with Julie about uh, talking um, to you know that group about like to say the League of Women Voters um, and, and know that they did vote with us when we went up for GMO labeling. I went and spoke in front of the, in front of the League of Women Voters and they have put out that they, you know, they want labeling, they want safety, they want reduce the pesticides. So they're on your side. Okay. I got to go, everyone. Bye. Okay, bye. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Good, night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.